Good day, everyone. I hope that you all are enjoying this uh, wonderful gala event. My name is David Utrilla, CEO of US Translation, and it is uh, my pleasure to introduce you today to our presenter speaker, Pavel Efinkov, uh, who will be presenting on Time for an Empty Pit Stop, Machine Translation Maintenance for Continuous optimization. So take it over, Pavel. Thank you, David. Oh, one more thing, uh, one more thing just to, to, to remind all of you that Pavel will be presenting and then when there is five minutes left, uh, we will be having a Q&A. Make sure to put your questions in the Q&A uh, section and, uh, and you can do those uh, questions uh, right away uh, as the presentation goes. And I will just be reading those uh, towards the end of, of Pavel's presentation. Take it over, Pavel. Thank you, David, very much. That's a very welcoming uh, welcome. Um, hello, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk um, about something that we uh, want to express and want to share with uh, as much people as we can. It's about how to maintain um, a model along the life cycle of um, your MT program or uh, localization program. So um, a little bit about myself. I started, um, I do have a manufacturing background. Um, I have like seven years experience in terms of technical documentation. I've been working with content management systems. And not far ago, I've transitioned to uh, machine translation, AI, and uh, I'm fascinated about the, this new world that I'm um, joining in, and hopefully you are as well. Um, this is a very um, uh, good transition to people that are um, trying to adopt MT and trying to launch their, their first MT program. Um, Two years ago, when I started at Intento, um, I did need to catch up with um, a lot of things in terms of I've heard so many new words. Um, there were so many things that were new for me. And I, th I feel that most of the companies and most of the clients, they experience the same thing. They're not quite sure what the best solution is or what the approach should be or what would be the tricky path to get to a good MT program. So there's some kind of a learning curve um, to that, which basically um, introduces something that I call a cheat sheet. Um, if, you're, um, if you're someone who wants to adopt machine translation, um, I would propose to do uh, certain steps that will help you to orientate in, the, in, the, uh, in your quest to adopting an MT program. So step number one is basically just have a look around. Um, in our industry, there's um, very much changing at the pace of a light. Um, we have new vendors, we have uh, providers that come out with new features, um, glossary support, uh, abbreviations, uh, uh, smart writings, or, or different format support for multiple use cases. You need to understand where you're going uh, at the end so that you could plan in ahead your um, uh, your path to that. Um, second, once you get familiar with what you would want to achieve, then just um, start, uh, make sure you have correct people that will be able to advise you in, um, in cases where you need that additional experience or um, a timely matter advice. Um, once you have a team, uh, you know where you're going, then um, you basically implement some model for some use case and basically give it a go. Along the way, you'll definitely feel that there's um, some things that you would like to tweak a little bit more or a little bit less, somewhere you want to have apply a little more of um, a glossary or uh, supply your model with uh, more data or make some fine tunings. That's fine because no result is perfect. You will constantly be improving your um, MT program as going forward. And then the step that we're gonna talk about today is going to, once you've established that base, 
you'll have to maintain that for a while to make sure that your own uh, empty program, your own models, they don't depreciate by time. So you keep them in a very good shape, which will basically give you the additional value and benefit out of them. Then <clears throat> if all goes good, if you're maintaining your program accordingly, then you just need to track and measure what were um, your metrics before you've applied MT and what would be the metrics after. Um, if all done correctly, you're definitely gonna see a value, um, especially uh, gains from additional volumes that MT would be uh, providing to you. And the next uh, basically uh, step would be to scale your program. If you do that for one language pair, it will be very um, easy to basically scale that to multiple language pair. You can also scale in a different directions in terms of applying to um, your MT to additional content types. You could have multiple models with the same language just by, uh, just by a different content type. You can extend to um, data formats. You can try translating HTMLs, um, subtitles, um, uh, or any other format that will be fitting your own use case. Also, platforms play a big role um, because multiple new use cases could introduce you live translations, for example, like um, supporting chats or just uh, website uh, communication or something more a bit of uh, knowledge base support or something like that. There's always something that would be unique uh, for your particular client or a customer or for your particular uh, use case. So um, next we're gonna talk um, more about the maintenance. So why do we actually bother doing that? Because it will take us um, quite a bit of effort and uh, some time that will be um, needed to achieve those things. Um, first of all, um, once you establish an empty program, once you have a model, you need to be aware of that if you're not going to treat it or maintain it in a while, it's just going to uh, depreciate by time. Um, it's better to be aware of what the state of your model is than to wait for that check engine button that will tell you that right now you have a problem. And that could possibly create some issues in your production environment, meaning that you'll have delays in terms of uh, supplying your translations or your clients won't, won't be able to see um, the translated output, which all lead to um, various communication problems for from minor to serious. Second is that um, as a company, every company is going forward. You always have new production launches. You have products that needs to be supported. You have support systems that help your clients orientate in your products and so on. There's a lot of uh, terminology that goes into it. Product names, um, do not translate items. There's a lot of things that could uh, benefit your own models if you do them, uh, if you update them constantly and regularly. Um, another thing is that um, once you establish your MT program, um, you're going to have some translated output. Depending on your volumes, it will be either a big one or a small one or a conservative one, but you will have translation, uh, translation output. If you, um, again, maintain, take care of your MT program, you should use the, these translations and improve your models even further. So a year from establishing an MT program, you should have uh, a quite um, a significant piece of translations for that specific language care. And you can then input all, the, all that data in back into your model training, basically improving it giving it more context, um, familiarizing it with um, new segments, areas, or descriptions of something that will always benefit uh, your own model. Um, another thing would be the effort. Um, you need to um, always have some kind of a measurement of um, what you could improve 
and how much value that will give you. Um, you need to be uh, focused on things that will give you the most effort saves that you can get with the kind of conservative uh, efforts that will take it from your side, basically. So you would gain uh, more value from doing less things. Um, this is more of an optimization, but in order to achieve that, you need to have those markers, those measurements or metrics that you're using uh, consistently throughout your um, empty program. Last but not least, you also need to uh, think about the industry itself. Um, there are um, a lot of vendors currently, and there will be a lot of vendors uh, tomorrow as well. Um, this is a slide from um, from our annual report that we're doing each year. And here we can see that through a couple of years, there's always new independent vendors that are popping up um, at our industry. Some of them provide uh, models or services for languages that are very specific uh, for small uh, resource languages and so on. Depending on your use case, um, you may stick to the model that you've introduced into your MT program. But if you see that there's a company that's just uh, basically create, uh, has been created and they offer a service that you're in, in desperate need, for example, a low resource language, you can then onboard um, one of one or two or multiple of those vendors and then uh, make basically an evaluation to see if those services or models are making sense for your particular use case, if they give you that additional, uh, that additional value. Um, then uh, we're gonna move forward and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to explain um, what we mean by uh, model support and model maintenance. We try to, um, we try to think of it as a, as a vehicle, as a car, um, once you buy a car, it's a new one, a fresh one. You don't have to basically do anything. You just turn on the keys and drive away. When time passes, you need to take care of your car, your engine. You need to do timely oil changes. You need to switch tires, uh, make sure that the brakes work okay, um, and a little bit of the nuances. If you do all that, that car could last you uh, quite longer than it would if you wouldn't be taking care of that. That's one thing. Another thing is that if you buy um, an old Chevy and you take care of, the, of that car for like 20 years, it will sp still be a good car. But if you compare uh, the Chevy to, for example, Tesla, it's not even close in terms of the value output that Tesla could give you. We think of that as um, a moment when you can think that I need to switch. The moment where your old Chevy um, is not that efficient enough than the competitors on the market. Uh, that awareness can, can give you a lot of benefit in terms of um, providing your um, your end users with those translations. If you see that there's a switch in the industry or inside of the vendor or inside of the uh, quality translation, that could be something that could benefit you and save you a lot of effort, time, and also money, of course. Um, then what we also advise to do is to plan everything um, in advance. Um, there's going to be a couple of activities that I'm going to um, describe in more details. They all have to be planned in advance. Um, I don't think I have to remind that during a year, so many things could all go wrong, vacations, sicknesses, pandemics, or anything else. You need to make sure that you're on track with things that you've planned um, for your empty program. You need to be aware that if you're lagging somewhere that you could either regroup at some point or um, make those uh, changes accordingly and maybe sacrifice something to get the more 
value out of your program as you can get during that particular year. So please plan your um, activities in advance. Make sure that you have the right resources, the, the right amount of people, and they can actually do those, uh, those activities in a timely manner and don't create um, basically holdups or hiccups for, uh, for your main production use. Then we're going to take a, a look at um, all those activities. So first of all, we're going to talk about glossaries. We've talked a little bit about them before. Um, glossaries is a super cool gateway to, um, to play around with your models. It's basically the first step of fine tuning. Um, some vendors support glossaries uh, natively, meaning that you don't need to um, develop anything. They have an option. You just need to import your glossaries to uh, to that particular provider, and they will apply that to the model. There's also, depending on which provider you're working with, that could be a glossary that goes on top of the model. It could be a different type of glossary that is uh, trained into the model when you're doing the training. Or um, it could be an external, uh, for example, not a native glossary support, where a glossary is basically applied after um, your model and MT provider is done with translation. After that, um, someone, a service or a company basically applies an additional glossary on top of that. So um, why? Why is it cool and what value it will bring in? Um, you'll have a very um, dynamic, um, switches in terms of updating your content. Product names, DNTs, um, abbreviations is a very cool one. Um, for example, if we're talking, a good example would be uh, medical industry, where they have very complex terms that, to be frankly, I don't think uh, everyone understands, but um, abbreviations can help you to communicate that complex idea or thought to the end client so they could have a much easier um, way of communicating with you as a company. Um, they're easy to manage. If you have a glossary, uh, be that a do not translate glossary or a regular glossary, it does not take you that much effort to manage it. Um, in a time, it could grow to a very big and very complex glossary. But when you're starting, that's something that you need to apply as soon as possible to get those additional values. So glossaries should be updated on a regular basis based upon um, your company's goals and activities. If you're introducing a new product, you definitely need to uh, make a plan on when exactly you're going to update um, those terms inside of your glossary after that update. Then we're going to move to um, an activity that is called machine translation quality monitoring. Um, this is an activity that basically gives you um, an overview. Um, you run specific checks. So you have um, some kind of content that you translate on a regular basis. This could be done in a on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, or something like that. Um, and you compare how different vendors to translate the same, um, the same content. If you see at a period of time that uh, translation changes, that could mean one of two things. Either the translation uh, got better, um, translation uh, in rare cases could be worse, or translation like changed completely. Like you cannot um, identify it's better or worse. It's just completely different. All of those three um, states give you information. If the qual uh, if the translation got better, then there's um, there's definitely something that has been updated on the vendor side. Um, they const they constantly improve their models. Um, fixing bugs, uh, implementing new features, and so on. If you see that this is a good um, good change, 
you can then schedule your uh, reevaluation or retraining of the same model or basically even replacing that in your production environment based on that particular highlight or we can call it a marker um if you see that the quality has changed to the worse, um, bugs happen, um, launches or updates could also fail. This could also make you um, a trigger, a marker for you to replace the current model. If that change is, um, is referring to the model that you're using, it's going to be a very good addition for you to think about using the backup model or maybe replacing or shuffling your models to make um, your adjustments accordingly. And also, um, this gives you um, a very good radar if there are new vendors, specifically in languages or language pairs that you're um, interested in, but there's no um, not a very good value right now. As we've seen before, vendors pop up each year in a quite significant numbers. And there's a chance that you can find a gem, um, a, a local company that provides a very good output for, for that particular use case. So that's that. Then we're going to um, talk about the models themselves. Um, as mentioned before, uh, vendors are constantly updating the, uh, their own uh, base models, models that are used um, as a base for any customization if, if a vendor provides that customization. Um, second thing is that um, once you do that customization, there's a particular algorithm that is used to train your model on your particular data. That algorithm is also improving. Um, there are adjustments that we've seen um, done, and it's very important that not only your base model should be, um, let's call it the latest version, but also the thing that's training your model should also be the latest uh, that, the, uh, that the market can offer to you. Then um, another key piece in terms of models is the um, is the data itself. Um, if we're going to start an empty program right now and we're going to clean our data uh, to try to train a model, having leaped a year forward, um, we can have a switch, a change into in terms of we can define clean data a little more um, clearly. So we can tweak something, remove some of the segments, include other segments that we thought that were garbage, but actually bring us value. So preparing your data could also change from a year. Um, if you're going to train, if you're going to clean the same data uh, for a model, but use a slightly improved algorithm, that could also give you the additional benefit. The last piece is data injection. We've talked about those translations that you accumulate over a period of time when you start your MT program. Use that information. Inject your model with fresh content that will give your model additional context, additional um, features, and materials to work with to make the translations that are looking for basically closer to what you would like to see. Um, last but not least, there's an activity called localization checkup. This is where we're measuring our, our success. This is a series of analytical checks that we're performing on, the, uh, on a translated projects, projects that are completed. We poke around, we analyze, and we're trying to uh, pinpoint uh, information that could be useful for us. Um, how much effort your post editors um, conclude to a very particular project? Um, how, uh, how long is the editing distance? Is there a difference between um, post editor number one or post editor number two? All of this information can basically um, give you additional triggers or markers to make uh, conclusions out of your uh, project. 
and then gives you a very good sense in terms of where your focus should be to get the most of the value of the improvements. Um, it also gives you a bigger picture in terms of the projects. You can have quite large, quite large projects that could involve many people. Um, and by doing these localization checkups, you can see who's doing fine, who's probably not that interested in your effort, who's doing worse? Um, where do we have uh, main or core problems that we've highlighted? Can we do something about that? Those questions could be um, very vital for your MT and very necessary for your uh, plan ahead for a year of what exactly you're going to be doing and how it will basically um, cumulate to, to a value. We will have um, tomorrow a dedicated talk about this particular step. It's very, very um, interesting. And if anyone is interested to that, I would invite you to join. Um, last thing um, is basically um, what we get as a result. Um, we should get a very constantly updated uh, terminology that is easy for our clients to understand. We're going to be aware of vendors and quality change inside of the models. Um, we're going to know and be flexible to those changes. We're going to know when to switch. Um, you're going to have your models updated uh, using the latest training algorithms, using the data that you've stored up, and so on. The efficiency which localization checkups could give you can then boost your um, corrections or fine tunings even more. If you do that all correctly, the only um, the only next question would be where would I like to expand next? And that that should be a very very good question. Yeah. So I think the, the main area is done. Um, so th thank you. Thank you, Pavel, uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions to ask you in the, for the next uh, uh, few minutes that we have left. The first uh, question is, uh, when, a, when a model becomes outdated? Um, a very good question. Um, I wouldn't say that um, models become outdated. I think the, the better way of thinking about that is once you're, um, let, let's, for example, say that we've trained a model. Um, you make a snapshot of this particular stance of a model configuration. It doesn't basically uh, deprecate um, the industry is moving forward. Um, every other model becomes better in some, uh, in some direction, but you're still using that old uh, snapshot. Um, if you would update that snapshot regularly, that could give you to, uh, the ability to catch up with the industry, with uh, new providers, vendors, and so on. If you stay within that same snapshot, you're not going to have any of those improvements. You're still going to have a good model, but there will be better models going forward uh, in a particular time frame. OK, the next question, what should be the order of the discussed activities? Uh, also a very good question. This um, heavily depends in terms of how your um, goals as a company um, are situated. It also depends on the schedule. So for example, if you know that you're going to do a very big translation project um, two months from now, uh, it will be a very good idea to schedule a retraining after that big project because you're going to have a lot of um, posted the data that you can use for retraining. Um, we would also recommend doing um, localization checkup and um, MTQM activities um, as soon as possible, just to give you that additional slice of information um, to you so that you could use that for your benefit, meaning that you'll have a baseline, um, you'll be aware of where your projects are going into, and it will be more easier for you to orientate and see that big picture and basically understand what would be your next steps or what would be more uh, more obvious for you as a next step. 
Okay, we have one last uh, question, um, and that is uh, one of the of your slides where you had a plan of the maintenance. There was a step hat swap and monitoring. Could you elaborate what that is exactly? Um, yes, this is an ongoing activity. We usually, um, once we introduce an empty program, would basically make um, a main model for a particular use case and also a backup. Um, that hop swap and monitoring refers to if something happens with the main model, we basically automatically um, address the request to the backup model. Um, that allows us not to lose uh, the translation uh, for real time translations that could be a lifesaver your request won't return you an empty translation. It will route the same request to a backup model. The backup model will provide you the, uh, the target translation and that will go to your client. So this is something that we, uh, we, we usually implement alongside of the empty program. Well, that's all the time that we have. Thank you, Pavel. I thank you all of you for attending this uh, a presentation and we invite you to attend the other presentations that we have throughout the day. Um, thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you for your time. Cheers.